Welcome to the Fit United Radio and Podcast, where each episode we aim to bring you fresh, relevant fitness and health related news, content, and interviews to help you reach new heights and ultimately become your best and fittest selves. All right, guys, in three, two, and one, let's go. David Goggins once said, It's so easy to be great nowadays because everyone else is weak. If you have any mental toughness, if you have any fraction of self-discipline, the ability to not want to do it, but still do it, if you can get through to doing things that you hate to do, on the other side is greatness. To grow in life, we must be willing to suffer. David Goggins is often referred to as the toughest athlete on the planet. He is the only member of the U.S. Armed Forces to complete SEAL training, including three Hell Weeks. Now, Hell Week is the fourth week of basic conditioning, and that is when students train for five days and five nights solid with a maximum total of four hours sleep. On top of that, he completed the U.S. Army Ranger School, where he graduated as an enlisted honor man, and Air Force Tactical Air Control Training. Since then, he has set the record for the most pull-ups in a 24-hour period, 4,030 of them. He completes an ultramarathons, ultramans, which is a double Ironman, and even won first place in a 48-hour national championship endurance foot race, running 203.5 miles, or 327.5 kilometers. He puts his body through the most grueling events known to man, but he continues to do them. But why? David Goggins is an extreme but prime example of mental fortitude. He speaks about not giving up and having a strong will to see things through. And that the reason why most of us never reach our full potential is because we cut ourselves short. In life, we do this all the time and we don't even think twice about that precedent we have now set in our lives. It's nature that we want to take the path of least resistance. We want the quickest, cheapest way to lose weight, to get that promotion, to get to that next step in our career or personal growth. We now live in a society where convenience is far more desirable than developing sound habits and self-discipline. So what is your takeaway? When we come up against some form of resistance in our lives, whether it be an irritating boss or colleague, an injury that just won't heal, kids that continually get into trouble, our relationship that continues to disappoint us again and again. There is a time and place for persistence, and there is a threshold between trying too hard and giving up too soon. The thing is, oftentimes we give up too soon at the first indication of some kind of hardship, some sort of barrier that stands between us and that one achievement that will give us fulfillment in our lives. Think of the mental strength to just run a marathon. The mind gives up before the body does. This is no small feat, and the physical feats that David Goggins has achieved are just examples of what we as humans are capable of. If we just keep pushing and realize that we have so much more of our potential we can unleash. I want to finish this Monday Drive with David Goggins talking about how his mindset is the key to unlocking our full potential. All right, y'all, stay motivated, stay strong, stay focused. Let's crush this week. Also, guys, you might have noticed Motivation Mondays are now called the Monday Drive. That is because I learned that motivation is what we have when things are easy and we are just excited about something new. But what is it that really gets us through our toughest times? It's drive. It's our drive that keeps us on the path towards our greatest selves when everything else around us is telling us otherwise. So from now on, these episodes will now be known as the Monday Drive. All right, guys, this is Kevin signing out. I will see you guys on the next one. I was such in a dungeon in my life, and I feel like I was such in a hole with nowhere to go, with so many issues and so many things to climb over and overcome. But the thing about it is we all have the ability to come from nothing to something. I was 300 pounds, and my goal was to be a Navy SEAL. Impossible goal. But what if I could? You have to be willing to suffer 
to get to the other side. And on the other side of suffering is a whole other world that people have no idea that even exists. From the very beginning, how I became who I am today, I grew up very soft, very insecure. I was beat as a child a lot, um, not only physically, but also mentally. My dad was an alcoholic, so it transferred to him being very abusive, me growing up, um, not just to me, but also my mother. And from that, my foundation at an early age was cracked. I had a really cracked foundation growing up. So with a cracked foundation and my mom having a cracked foundation, I had no one to really, you know, show me the ropes, show me the way. And so we went from that kind of cracked foundation to another cracked foundation. I went to a small town in Indiana, in Brazil, Indiana. And there was about five black families there. So being called nigger was something that happened regularly. I had a lot of friends, but also, you know, when you have a cracked foundation, the only thing you really see is the negative. You don't see a lot of people that like you. All you see is the people that don't like you. So that cracked foundation just kept on getting more and more cracked. And throughout the years, I developed a stutter, had a lot of issues with uh, people, social anxiety. Um, I copied all through school. I had a learning disability, so I cheated a lot going through school. So my foundation continued to get cracked. And when you get to that point in your life and no one is there to really help you out, you have to figure some things out. So what made me who I am today is basically that cracked foundation and not liking it. So I had to learn how to mend that cracked foundation alone. And what happens is you, you have to really develop a lot of mental toughness. But to me, mental toughness wasn't enough. I had to really develop a calloused mind. So I had a victim mentality. I was a victim. Everybody messed my life up. My dad, society, my mom, whatever it may be, I was dealt a bad hand. And so it gives you a victim mentality. So I developed a way to get over the victim's mentality. And it was through callous in your mind. So I was literally callous and over the victim's mentality through outworking all my faults. So I developed a work ethic that became known as, you know, what it is now. That's how I got this world toughest man because I, I'm not the best person in the world. I'm not, I'm not the smartest. I'm not anything. But I learned to outwork everybody around me. And that's how I got to where I'm at today. So I don't live a very glamorous life at all. I live uh, very uncomfortable to a lot of people. It's not that I'm broke. It's not that I don't have the means to do it. It's like a boxer. A boxer may have a $4 million house, but before a big fight, he may go away to the mountains for about two months to train. Totally secluded, desolate world, may live on a cot, may live on the ground. What that boxer's doing is he's trying to form his mentality. He's trying to get that mentality to a very granimalistic state. So when he goes inside that ring, his mentality is ready to do whatever it takes to win that boxing match. So what I realized from my foundation growing up was I had a very soft, soft mind. And I live that way now, like that boxer training for that big fight. You know, I live that way all the time. So I always, I'm always sharpening my sword. And how I sharpen my sword is I have a mentality that my refrigerator is never full. I've never arrived. And every time I get close to the top of a mountain, I fall back down on purpose. I believe that true growth is at scratch. Starting from scratch is true growth. You have to have friction in your life. There has to be friction in your life for you to be able to move forward. So many people call me the hardest man on the planet. I got to that point from having a never ending work ethic. So if you want anything in life, a lot of people, we live in a society right now where mediocrity is often rewarded. Like mediocrity is almost the standard. And for me, if you live that way, that's where you could be at. So let's say you have 10 people. You have 10 people and all of them are mediocre. And you beat those 10 people in a race or at work, whatever it may be, you're really still mediocre. What we do in life is we set our standards to everybody else. 
What we do in life is we look at what someone did before us. We look at a standard. I don't look at anybody's standard. I set my own standard. And how I became this, whatever people call the hardest man on the planet, is I literally set my own standards. I started to reinvent the wheel for myself. I didn't follow the crowd. Whatever the crowd was doing, I didn't follow them. I did what I had to do to get where I had to go. And in doing that, that's where true growth is, is finding yourself. I'm not trying to be like Michael Jordan or be like Tiger Woods or anybody else. I'm trying to be like David Goggins. And through that, you can find out what you're made of. And you, you are trying to conquer yourself. And that's how I got this title. My advice to people who are going through hard times, a lot of people know my story. I come from a very, very, very humble beginning. You have to be open with that. Like for instance, social media. A lot of people are on social media and what they do is they show you the best side of them. Everybody on social media, everybody out here in this world, if you have friends, everybody has two sides to them. We have the side that we want you to see, which is our best side, our best side. But we also have this side that we're not working on. The side we're not working on is that side that we want no one to see. Like on social media, everybody posts where they're going, you know, I'm, I'm going here for vacation. This is me in the gym. This is me here. This is me here. What I do is I post my bad side. I want, I let everybody know I'm this, I'm this, I'm this. I have to work on all these things. It's okay. So the first thing is you got to accept the fact that everybody judging you, you judging yourself, it is okay to be f***ed up. It's okay to not be exactly like everybody else. It's not, you know, it's okay to not follow the crowd. So that's the, that's the one thing I would tell people is don't worry about everybody else is doing. Worry about what you're doing. Focus on what you're doing because everybody else out there, everybody judging you, they also have problems themselves. And that's what I realized myself. So I stopped comparing myself to everybody else. And I just compare myself to me. I'm, about, I'm my own hero. I'm my own hero. I believe that a lot more people can relate to the struggle a lot more than the, than the success. I, it, people relate a lot more to that. You know, I relate a lot more to a person who's the underdog. Most of us in this world are underdogs. There's very few of us out here who are the one percenters. And those one percenters are those people who are like the CEOs, these people who are like the best basketball, the best golfer. Very few people are there. It's those people who are at the very bottom in the middle who are trying to get there. It's all about work ethic. So everybody likes the underdog. That's why that whole Rocky story, everybody loves a Rocky story. But the thing about it is, to develop that Rocky story, you gotta work your ass off. And not many people are willing to do that part of it. That's the, that's the hard part about overcoming the odds, overcoming yourself, is you have to create a Rocky story. So why I like the Rocky film so much is when I was growing up, I didn't have much of a role model growing up. So in between my cheating and me ditching school and all these things, I got obsessed with people that I saw in my life in their life. And I, I, I got obsessed with people who struggled, with people who were at the bottom of the daggone sewer. I got obsessed with watching these people and I got obsessed with watching um, Rocky won round 14. And the reason why this specific round is, even to this day, I'm 43 years old. To this day, it puts chills in my body, is I can go back to where I was 10, 11, 12 years old, whenever the movie came out. And I remember my first time watching it. And I was watching round 14 of Rocky one. And I'll never forget watching this guy who was Rocky getting his butt kicked. Apollo Creed was just knocking him down, beating him up. And all he wanted to do was go to distance. And to a lot of people, this makes no sense to them. But for a kid who's looking for strength, who's looking for, like, is, is it possible? You're looking for, is it possible? Can I pull off the impossible? And me watching this film, that's what I saw. So it was a no-name boxer against the best boxer in the world, who's Apollo Creed. And I watched this guy in the ring, who's Rocky, just getting his butt kicked, falling down, getting up. In the 14th round, Apollo is like, just killing this guy. But also, Apollo's tired. He's, he's extremely tired. But Apollo knocks him down in the 14th round for like the 30th time. 
And even Rocky's coach, Mickey, is telling Rocky to stay down. And Apollo turns around. He turns around, he thinks that he got this guy. He thinks he beat him. He thinks he finally took this guy out. This guy who's kept coming at him and coming at him and coming at him. Apollo Creed turns around, puts his arms in the air. He turns his back to Rocky, just assuming he's down. I got him. Everybody in the crowd is saying, stay down. Everybody. This guy is climbing the ropes to get back up. Totally destroyed. Nothing left, but he found something. And this is the thing about it. He found something. And I watched this guy get up. And once he gets up, Apollo Creed turns around and sees this. And the look I saw, most people don't even see this. The look I saw on Apollo Creed's face was this look of total awe of who the hell are you? Who am I fighting? It looked like Apollo Creed's soul left his body and Rocky got his gloves and motioned him to come on. And Apollo Creed put his head down and shook his head. Why that scene resonates with me so much was I was such in a dungeon in my life and I felt like I was such in a hole with nowhere to go, with so many issues and so many things to climb over and overcome on my own. I wanted every obstacle and every person that ever doubted me to look like Apollo Creed. I wanted the people, whoever it was, people, obstacles, whatever, to look at me like this guy is gonna continue coming after me. I wanted what that, what Rocky had. This ability to keep getting up. I don't care if I win. I don't care if I'm the best. It's not about being the hardest man in the world. I just want to keep coming after you. So through years and years and years of visualizing that scene of that guy just getting up, it's just a movie to some people. But to me, it became what my reality had to become. I had to become that guy who could run on broken legs going through Hell Week who can endure the most pain, the most suffering. To get where I have to go, I'm gonna to have to be that guy. And a lot of people will never understand that because a lot of people just don't have that kind of mindset, but we all have it. I came from nothing. But the thing about it is, we all have the ability to come from nothing to something. But it takes that kind of spirit. It takes that kind of spirit. The cookie jar. The cookie jar is something that I developed years ago. So what happens to me, happens to a lot of us in situations. We get put in these situations. So I, my whole life, I've been put in struggles. I've put myself in struggles. I've purposely put obstacles in front of me to see how I'm going to feel. Like, for instance, I run 205 miles at one time, nonstop. Do you know what goes through your mind? When your goal is to run over 200 miles and you're at mile 100, you're at mile 100, you've run for over 24 hours and your body is broken, you're destroyed. You have nothing left, but you have 100 plus more miles to go. How do you find more? So I developed this thing called the cookie jar and the cookie jar is a reminder. That's all it is, it's a reminder. Even the hardest person in the planet Earth, we forget how badass we are when times get hard. When times get hard, your mind spazzes out. It freaks out, it goes somewhere else. We forget that cookie jar, you gotta take one second, take one second, and that cookie jar has all these things in it, all the things you overcame, all the things that you suffered through, all the things that got in your way and you fought through. So you go in your mental cookie jar when you're going through bad times and you want to quit and you want to bail out, you think about it. Okay, David, what did you do? You went through two hell weeks. You went through ranger school. You went through this. You went through that. It's a reminder. It's a reminder that you are that badass. And it's a, it's, that's all it is. The, the cookie jar is you take one second when you're in an extreme environment and your mind and your body are saying, we're done. We need to quit. You gotta remind yourself, hang on a second. I've overcome a hell of a lot more than this. And I have the strength to persevere, to move on, to not be mediocre, to not settle for what's in front of me, to overcome the odds. The what if mentality 
is a mentality of a lot of us in this world have people who say we cannot do something. You can't do it, you're too short, you look a certain way, you act a certain way, you're not smart enough. I hit that roadblock every time. I was 300 pounds. I'll never forget, I was 300 pounds. I went from 175 to 300 pounds and my goal was to be a Navy SEAL. Impossible goal. And every Navy recruiter that saw me said that, besides one. Every recruiter said, there's no way, man. You're 297 pounds and you gotta lose so much weight so fast. I talked to one recruiter, and I never get getting back in my truck, and he said, you cannot do this. But I got in my truck and I said to myself, but what if I could? What if I could pull off this miracle? How will I feel at the very end if I can defy all the odds? The what if mentality is this guy told me, I was a 36 African American Navy SEAL in Navy SEAL history, over 70 years. This guy told me there's only 35 African Americans to ever be a Navy SEAL. He was pretty much telling me, you ain't got what it takes. I took that and said, what if I can be the 36th? Versus taking what he said, all the negativity he's putting on me because he can't, he can't imagine himself doing what I'm about to do. So most people who can't imagine it, they, they reflect, it's like a mirror. They put that right on you. If they can't see themselves doing it, I can't see you doing it. I take that mirror and I totally discard it. And I say, what if I can be the 36th person to ever do it? So I use all their negativity as positivity and fuel to get me to where I need to go. What drives me today is being my best. And being my best is a never ending journey. Uh, a lot of people call me obsessed. That's fine, I probably am obsessed. When you finally realize like for me, that humble beginning I had, when you realize that I could have literally given up and right now at 43, I could still be a 300 pound man spraying for cockroaches. It's truly amazing that a lot of us walk this planet Earth being a fraction of what we're capable of being. I look back on when I was 24 years old and that could have been my 100%. If I chose to take the path of least resistance, that could have been my 100%. Never knowing that in that 300 pound body, the kid who couldn't read all this other stuff, four grade reading level, is now a person that's been through almost every special ops training in the world, has broke several records, and has continued to grow. Once you realize what's on the other side of that, that will keep you, I'm the most driven person in the world because I realized that I was leaving so much on the table. I was leaving so much on the table, never knowing that inside that fat guy was this person here. And once you peel the crawl, you know, you know, you know peel that crust away and see who you really are, you open your mind to a whole nother world. So I've opened my mind up to a whole nother world that most people can't even fathom because they haven't dug deep into their own personal problems. So they think, people think I'm crazy because I found a whole nother way of living. I think they're crazy for never even trying to get to the other side of whatever's in front of them. So what drives me every day is finding more of myself. So how I suggest to someone of breaking the habit of constantly making excuses is do something every day that sucks. There's a, there's a saying out there. There's a saying that says, triple down on your strengths. Tripling down on your strengths does one thing to you. It makes you very comfortable. It makes you very strong at what you're good at. So why people have excuses is that's the world they live in. They live in a world where if they're good at running, all they do is run. If they're good at reading, all they do is read. So the excuse world comes up is because when the world, life, doesn't give a damn what you're good at, it's just gonna put challenges in front of you. So when that challenge comes up that you're not great at, the first thing the whole triple down on your strength mentality does is it forces you to say, I'm not good at it. 
so I'm not going to do it. Versus saying, I'm not good at it. I'm going to be great at it. I'm going to figure out. I'm going to put the work. That's how you start to callous your mind. The excuses that we're making are just because we're not good at it. So it makes us feel insecure. It makes us feel a certain way. That's why I tell everybody, you cannot fix anything in life until you fix yourself. A lot of people out here give great, great. How many people do you know in your life that give great advice? They give the best advice on the planet Earth, but their life's all jacked up. No one looks inside themselves because what they see inside is ugly. It's ugly. It's full of lies. It's full of secrets. It's full of insecurities. Once you dive into that, you have no more excuses because you'll start ripping away those layers of insecurities. You know, the other end of those layers is exactly who you truly are. So do something every day that sucks. Get outside your comfort zone. Triple down on your weaknesses, not your strengths. That's how you grow. That's how you stop making excuses. So my book's coming out December 4th. It's called Can't Hurt Me. Why I titled it Can't Hurt Me is this book is a self-help memoir. We have a whole bunch of self-help books out there that are five-step, pro, you know, five-step, five-step this, five-step this. Mine is not a five-step program. Mine is about getting to the root of the problem. And the root of the problem is yourself. You have to master your own mind. And once you master your mind, you know, you know your own mind, everything else is, is, is taken care of. So Can Hurt Me is about life. It's about you. It's about my mentality. But you get to develop your own mentality. So life is full of people who are getting bullied, people who are once again insecure, people who are going through problems, a lot of problems. But if you have this mentality that you start to develop of you can't hurt me. When I was, when I was going through SEAL training, all the training I went through, it's what you say to yourself on a daily basis. If you say you can't hurt me, can't hurt me. Every time I got my ass kicked in everything I did, whether it be a fight or a test or going through SEAL training or ranger school, can't hurt me, can't hurt me, can't hurt me. It starts to get in your mind. And before you know it, it's the truth. So when you fail, you fall on your ass, somebody bullies you, whatever's going on in your life, can't hurt me. Because why that, stands, why that saying is true is not because you say it, you have to put the work in to develop that callous mind to believe it's true. So a lot of people want to know what I say to myself when I'm out here doing these long events, my self-talk. So, so what are you saying to yourself, David, when you're out there and you're at mile 75 of a 135 mile run through Death Valley? Well, I tell myself, Back in the day, I was the weakest person that God ever created. That's what I thought. I made this man to be the hardest man God ever created. That's what I tell myself. I tell myself I'm the hardest man that God ever created. Is it true? I don't care if it's true or not. I believe it. But a lot of people, like these books, self-talk, visualization, self-talk doesn't mean anything. You can tell yourself you're the best person to ever live. Self-talk without the work without the work, it's just lies. So when I'm telling myself I'm the hardest man on the planet, when I'm in the worst situation possible, I'm going back to the three hours I put into training every day. I'm going back to the 3 a.m. wake up call, looking at my running shoes thinking, God dog, 75 days in a row, no days off, running 15 miles a day. I don't want to do it. And you lace them up. So when I'm in that horrible spot and I'm talking to myself, I'm also recalling all the training sessions, all the years, all the hard work. So when I talk to myself that way, that self-talk is real. It's not lies. Because if you're taking a test in school and you haven't studied for it, and you say, I'm going to pass this test, chances are you're going to fail it because you haven't put the time in to get you know, the result of passing. So self-talk is huge, but putting the work in is bigger. There's a lot of people in life who are theorists. Theorists are people who 
It may be that guy in the corner who's at the library all day long, old man with gray hair. He's the master of the mind. He mastered the mind by being a theorist. He got all these books and read about how the brain is supposed to work. That's a theorist. He has all these theories on how it's supposed to be done. You want to be a practitioner in life. A lot of people who study theories will put these bars, these invisible bars and barriers on your mind about what we can and cannot achieve as human beings. That's a theorist. A practitioner will listen to a man like a theorist and defy the odds. Don't ever be a theorist, be a practitioner. Be a guy who goes out there and actually does the work. Put yourself in situations. Like when I was going through Hell Week, I got to, I got to see where my mind was. It's 130 hours, Hell Week's 130 hours. At hour 48, 72, your mind is a mess. You're all over the place. A theorist would tell me what he thinks is going to happen. A practitioner dives into suffering, and as he's suffering, he's then writing the book while he's suffering. It's easy to write a book while you are in a nice 72-degree library flipping the page. A practitioner writes a book when he's in the hell, when he's in suffering, when it's 50 degree water, everybody's quitting, snot's coming out your nose. That's how you really start to figure out what the mind and body are capable of. Don't read a book about it. Don't read what some man wrote. Put yourself in the environment. See how you start to talk to yourself in the worst times, in the worst situations. And that's how you start to develop that real self-talk, that real visualization, the real tools to get through those hard times. You have to be willing to suffer to get to the other side. You know, the other side of suffering is a whole other world that people have no idea that even exists.